Malola Lai, Talofalava, Kirana, Fakalofa Atu, Buenos Dias, Minglaba, Hola, Bonjour, Ahoy, Sevos, Wan Young, and Claire Moira. So we're going to be looking at the raising of uh, Lazarus this morning, and I've asked Willie to come and read our scripture in Psalm 1. Ole faita wino le fiunga pa ia lo tatu o tua. Na mo mai le le tusi evangelia Ioanne, lo na mata upu full mantas. O te faita mo te fai upu tos full mantolu. E fa ngata mai te fai upu fast full mant fa. Fa fonga mai e ia fiunga pa ia lo tatu o tua. O si la fia e Jesu o ia o tangi. Mai u tai o ma o mai, ma o fe tangi si. O na tangi te le lea. Olona finangalu, maua atu lava oia. Ona fa ape atu lea. O fea na o tōtu winai oia. O fa ape a maila atu ia te ia leali ie. Maliu maia, ete sila sila iai. O tangi Iesu, ona fa ape ane lea o iutaia. Fa auta ele tele olona alofo ia te ilatou. A o isi o ilatou, o fa ape ane. Ele ima faya ele neitangata na ia fa pula mato ta waso ona va va fo ile oti ole neitangata uwa to ti ngate le fin ngalo Yesu ona ole o ila to le tunga mau ole ana le uwa tu fo ile ma ilo na ngutu uwa feta la yatu Yesu abe esa ia le ma ona fa mai le ya te ia o ma retel to a fin ole oti le le ie wo ina manongi a wall on a poor fale nay. Ua feta la yatu yesu yate ye. Pen ole fa yatu e yati oe. A fire to tal ton. On a low little mamalo le tour. On a lato of Israel or man into wild woods. On a tap isle of a phone or yesu of a peat. Lord am I, O te fa feta yatu yatu oe, a wa o e fa fu fonga ma yatau, ua o i loa foi, e te fa fu fonga ma yatau i le au noa. Ai pe ta i wa o foi yat, o no ole moto tanga to lo o vanga vangai, ina i atali tonu i la to ua e a wina ma yau, ua i a feta la yatu i opu, o na alanga le o i a ole o tele, la sa aloe. In our soul, if I on our lule, if I follow you, not or first we see on the way, more the limb, if we see or first for you on the matter, the soul solo on a feta laia to leo, yes, so ya te lato the talaia ya te ya in our to what we are a lu. If I'm a new year, my letter to a fighter, we know land and film, but your name say your father, vow, father, vow love. Amen. Thank you, Willie. So let me read our scriptures this morning to you. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man keep this man from dying? Jesus once more was deeply moved. He came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Master, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he's been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God. So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. 
I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with the strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. We're in a series on the Gospel of John, uh, a walk through the life of Jesus as recorded by John in the New Testament. An account like any other account, John lived longer than any of the other disciples and wrote the fourth and final biography of Jesus in the New Testament. 90% of what he tells us isn't found anywhere else. It says if he went back over the other three and told the stories that he felt they'd left out. It really is the untold story finally told. And in this series, we're taking a tour of some of what John reveals. And here, this morning, we read the story of the most dramatic, provocative miracle in the gospel. Death does not have the same finality for Jesus as it does for others. And in John's sign, this is certainly the most dramatic those who have difficulty with the miraculous may well find themselves stumbling here. However, John's whole gospel aims to affirm that God has indeed intervened in the history of the world. An incarnational theology at once makes room for a God, a story like this, where the God, power of God is over natural human events. And today, we come to the raising of a dead man back to life. Someone very dear to Jesus. His name was Lazarus, and he had two sisters, Mary and Martha. And Jesus was actually very, very close to all of them, all three of them. He visited them often, stayed in their home, and he would kind of go there, I think, to rest and refuel and renew. And when you read the New Testament, you find that among the disciples, Jesus was closest to Peter, James, and John. And of them, he was closest to John. But outside of that circle, the three people he was just naturally seen to be drawn to, that kind of put the most emotional energy back into his tank, were Mary and Martha. These two sisters are very close to Jesus. And they're central in our story. The woman sent a report to Jesus, not mentioning Lazarus by name, and also aware of the considerable risk that it would pose him to come back, simply referring to him as the one you love. Now, first scripture there, 11.3, John 11.3. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus would immediately know who they're talking about. They're in a real dilemma and express regret that if only, if only Jesus had been there, Lazarus would not have died. In John eleven twenty one, 21, Lord Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. They also know the considerable hostility now of Jerusalem's leadership towards Jesus and the associated risk he faced actually traveling to them. When Jesus finally decided to go to Judea, it must have been very frightening for his disciples. You'll see why in that last verse there. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago, the Jews were trying to stone you, and yet you want to go back? So there was risk for him to come. And when Jesus finally arrives, Lazarus has been dead for four days. Now, this is significant. There was a well-known Jewish belief that the soul of a dead person remained in the vicinity of the body, hoping to re-enter it for three days. Three days. But once decomposition had set in, then the soul had departed. And John wants us to know that Lazarus is really dead. This miracle cannot be put down to resuscitation. He was really dead. 
When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept. Then the Jews see, see how he loved them. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus once more was deeply moved and came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. It's important to notice some of the language here. Jesus was deeply moved in spirit and troubled, and he wept and he cried. And then again, we read a second time, he was deeply moved. Now that phrase, deeply moved in the original Greek language, is not an easy one to translate into English. Jesus is not just emotionally upset and full of grief and pain. He's actually very, very angry. The Greek suggests an anger at the deepest level of his very being. Now, he's not angry at Mary or Martha, but at death itself and the devastation that it brings. His only interest now is to locate the tomb and to demonstrate God's awesome power over death. And as Jesus approached the tomb, once again, he is deeply moved. He's outraged at what he sees. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad over, for he's been dead for four days. Martha warns Jesus that Lazarus has been dead for four days and there's going to be a pretty strong smell at the body as it's begun to decompose. If you've ever had the misfortune to be around a body when it's decomposing, there is a strong smell. All this reminds us again that Lazarus is truly dead. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and he said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And a big part of what Derek was saying this morning was to cultivate a relationship with the Holy Spirit, the person, so that you can hear his voice and hear his nudging towards you. Jesus has now reached out beyond Mary and Martha and he says, for the benefit of the people standing here. In some way, this whole issue is for those who have gathered, for their benefit. And Jesus lifted his eyes upward. So Jesus' language and his body language, I think, was not only for this prayer, but it was also for his mission on earth. Here, even at the tomb of his close, close friend, his mind is on his mission to the world. And most immediately to those who were standing around. He prays publicly. And so it's for the benefit as much of the family as for the bystanders. This is done to demonstrate that his work is done in unison with God's will. Jesus never acted alone. John 5, 19. Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his father doing because what the father does, the son also does. And then we see the dramatic, amazing point in this story in John 11, 43 to 44. When it said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to him, take off the grave clothes and let him go. He called Lazarus by name. The shepherd whose voice is recognized by his sheep calls them by name. And he calls Lazarus as he calls and knows each one of us by name. And the shepherd lays down 
his life for his sheep. This is the authority of a love that Christ gives that will go on to when he dies, to hang on a cross to suffer for us. And when Lazarus emerges from the tomb, he's found in grave wrappings, which were strips of fabric around his limbs and filled with burial spices. Jewish burials also tied the jaw closed and covered the face with a linen cross. Jesus issues this practical command. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. I wonder if he had to say that because everybody was so stunned. You know, can you imagine being there? And he's called him and he comes out. I'm not sure whether I would have stayed or run away. I don't know. Lazarus is literally set free, restored to the physical life for a few more years anyway, but assured of eternal life. And what a spectacle I must have been, witnessed by a growing crowd. And Jews had strict laws about clean and unclean bodies and strict rules about purification. And while the text is silent, we can imagine that Jesus, who had a reputation for touching those who were deemed untouchable, was probably one of the very first to embrace his friend. And this would have left the crowd stunned. Stunned. The Lord of life demonstrates that he is victor over death, while at the same time his enemies are now plotting to take his life. And John wants us to know that the works of Jesus are anchored in historical events. He's not just the light. He gives sight to a blind man. He's not just the resurrection and life. He raises Lazarus from the dead. The revelation of Jesus does not take place apart from concrete acts in history. And this follows the general pattern of John's message. Jesus has entered into human history and brought a number of signs that point to his true identity. And the raising of Lazarus is the seventh and final sign of Jesus. The story of Lazarus and the empty tomb anticipates the story of Jesus and his empty tomb. The Lord who has power over life has power over his own life too. John 10, 17. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. If the raising of Lazarus is the final climactic scene of Jesus, how much will his resurrection from the dead usurp it? If the lordship of Jesus over death is the chief theme in this chapter, the prospect of Jesus' crucifixion is a theme that follows it in the chapters that we're going to look at. The tomb that cannot hold Lazarus cannot hold him either. Amen. John eleven fifty. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish. So this was Cyphus telling us that the death of Jesus had a purpose. He will die for his people and the nation. And in Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. Not the same Lazarus, by the way, <laughs> if you're wondering. The rich man does not dispense grace to a poor man that he passes just about every day while he's alive. But once he has died, the rich man calls out for help. And when none is forthcoming, he pleads with Abraham to send a message to his home to warn his five brothers what the afterlife may hold for them. And Abraham gives the stunning answer in Luke 16. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets, let them listen to him, to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if somebody rises from the dead. Incredible to us as it may seem, even a resurrection miracle will not be sufficient to persuade some people of the power and the reality of Jesus. This is amazing. While signs can lead to faith, 
Signs alone cannot. Miracles do not necessarily themselves transform lives. What did he say? They will not be convinced even if someone rises from the dead. That's a hard heart. And since Luke is writing from the vantage view of the resurrection, he's no doubt thinking about the resurrection of Christ too. And people living in Jerusalem refuse to believe despite Jesus returning from the dead. The Bible is clear. Words must accompany deeds. The sign points to Jesus and he must be preached. He is our Lord. Any power is power in Christ. And when Paul prays for the Ephesians at the beginning of his letter, he asks God to confirm in their hearts the features that come with being in Christ. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparable great power for us who believe. The power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly realms. Paul prays that the Christians will know the power and hope available to them. He prays that the reality of the rich inheritance, our rich inheritance, will transform them and they will see the power of God. God is victor over death. Jesus, as his son likewise, understood his incomparable great power to call a man like Lazarus out of a tomb. When I was a hospital chaplain, I got to visit with a woman that I will call Claire. She was just over 80 years and had come into hospital because she'd become unwell and she needed to have some tests done. She was a woman who devoted her life to the church. And for a few weeks, I looked forward to visiting her as she told me stories of her Christian life, mostly from her experience as a leader of one or type or another in the church. And she seemed quite well, and I was expecting her to be discharged soon. However, when I went to visit her, she told me that tests had revealed a brain tumor. And then... She mentioned the most, one of the most awful words in the medical dictionary. It was inoperable. Inoperable. And that word may just be one of the worst medical words ever invented. <laughs> she stayed in hospital a little longer, and then she went home. The doctors had told her that she had about three months to live. On my last visit, she told me, Graham, don't worry about me. She was said, I'm about to go on the greatest adventure of my life. Now, she never denied the anguish of what was coming, right? But she did look it straight in the eye, refusing to flinch. Her strength was grounded in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and so should ours. She knew him. She knew who he was. She knew his power, his truth, his grace. She also knew that he was waiting for her, waiting for her the moment she died. Jesus overpowered death at the tomb of Lazarus and likewise he overpowered the fear of death for Claire. I'm told that when tourists come to Jerusalem, one of the most important places for them to visit is the church commemorating Jesus' burial, burial and resurrection. Guy books written in English refer to it as the church of the Holy Spectre. Apparently, Arabs and Jews who are used to this, so when they find visitors wandering around Jerusalem's Christian quarter, they send them in the right direction. The ancient churches of Jerusalem have a different name, actually, for the church. For them, it has always been known as the Church of the Resurrection, recalling that the important events that happened there. The church recalls not the tomb, but the resurrection life that came from the tomb. It's a place of victory and life, not of sorrow and defeat. And we know that Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they will die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? This is why 
Jerusalem Christians are right in refusing to let their central church become a memorial to Jesus' death. It is not. It's a memorial to the completed works of Jesus by which he embraced death fully and defeated it, standing triumphant before his very grave. The raising of Lazarus points us elsewhere, reminding us that Jesus' work is greater even than this miracle. Jesus overwhelmed the grim scene of Lazarus' grave with, his God, with God's power, and he faced his own death with confidence that the same power of God would rescue him from the grave. The raising of Lazarus is a story that should encourage us to give us strength to face our own mortality, or maybe the death of someone close to us. By the virtue of the Lord whom we worship, no longer, no longer does death have the final say over our lives. This does not mean that we do not mourn when someone dies. For sure, many now see the funeral as an opportunity to celebrate life and victory of the person. And to a degree, this is always true. But we need to be careful that it doesn't deny a basic human need to express sorrow and grief that comes with personal death and loss. And also, we can overlook an important part of the story. Martha and Mary were crying. Jesus did not say to them, if you believe that I'll rise from the dead, why are you crying for? He did not say to Mary, if only you'll have a victorious faith, you should be filled with hope because I'm here. And this is an important point. Jesus does not impede this family's grief or their grieving. In fact, he joins with them and cries as well. And as he does that, he offers them solidarity. It is right to describe death as ter terrible and painful without compromising the quality of our faith. Jesus himself cried at the records brought to this family. And of course, he also said in Matthew, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. And death will never have the final say over our lives. And I like this quote from Al Morris in his commentary on John. Death is but a gateway to further life and fellowship with God. He raised Lazarus from the dead, giving the world a foretaste, a picture of what was to come, of what he was able to bring, of what his life could hold for theirs, not just in the resurrection life, but in spiritual resurrection today. When Jesus asked Martha if she believed, he wasn't saying, do you believe I can raise Lazarus from the dead before the great resurrection at the end of time? He was saying, do you believe that faith in me brings life now? Right now, a relationship with him that will never end and that physical death can never destroy Never destroy. And do you believe that no matter what happens in life, I am enough? And she said, yes, I do. And that's when he raised Lazarus. To let Martha know, to let Mary know, and to let you and I know that he really is the resurrection and the life. And we can trust him in that way. And that's the heart of it. Now, I know you're going to face moments in your life, the most difficult, painful confusing, heart-tearing, gut-wrenching, life-shattering moments in your life where you're going to have to ask the question, is Jesus enough? Is he going to be enough? Because sometimes that's all you have. Your trust in him, your hope in him is all you're going to have to hold on to. And so in the end, the story is a story about faith. A faith that may not know the answer to why things happen, but trusts in the one who does. A faith that Jesus could bring a brother back, even from the dead, and trusted Jesus and loved him. A Jesus who knows the why of our life, who weeps with our pain. John 8, 
And then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. This is the truth. You are made in the image of God. You have a body, and most of it probably works okay. <laughs> most of it. God loves you. He calls you his child, a child of the most great high. And because Jesus came to teach and live and died on a cross and was resurrected, we have hope. We have hope. You have a future. You have a future with God forever. You've been received into God's new community, the church, where you can belong, where you can be loved, and where you can be accepted. And you have also been given gifts by God. As the worship team comes, let me finish by saying this. Every single one of you is created to make a unique, eternal contribution to the work of God today. Even if you make mistakes, which we all do, promise, God promises to work through you in spite of your mistakes. The miracle of God's love is that he should somehow become a human being, work as a carpenter, grow hungry and tired and weak, and should teach and even cry for you and me. For in the end of the story of God's love, we will never die. And for in the end, the story of God's love for us will never die. Not after God became human, not after the cross, not after the resurrection, his love will last forever. Amen. Amen. I do sometimes like to uh, pull out a very old song for the last song of the service. It seems appropriate sometimes. And a couple of weeks ago, we, we sung a song that was 150 years old. Today, we're going to sing a song that's 2,500 years old. If you can't see the screen, you can look it up. It's uh, Psalm 25. To you, I lift my soul In you, O oh God I place my trust
May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forever. Amen.